Okay, so this is going to be my AU class that I presented last year, uh, covering how you can take the former 360 data into other applications for visualization workflows. Uh, my name is Samuel McAllister. I'm based in Sydney, Australia. It's uh, just turned 8 o'clock here in the morning. Uh, we're on Friday at the moment, so um, thank you very much for allowing me to do this on my Friday morning and not my Saturday morning at 6 a.m. I uh, really appreciate it. It's a, a great turnout today, so thank you very much. Uh, okay, so the class is going to be, uh, just give you an overview of the summary. I'm just going to move my uh, screen across a little bit here. Um, it's going to be how you can uh, use the data for high-end presentations. So there's the SketchUp sort of look and feel that you can get out of a lot of applications, but in this case I wanted to try and take the data uh, out in several different file formats and then demonstrate how you can present it in a couple of other applications that come in the Autodesk AEC industry collections where you get tools um, like Infowix 360 and 3ds Max and these are a couple of visualization tools that allow you to import the form, form of data into and then uh, either animate or produce uh, high-end visualizations. So I'm going to take you through some of the best practices of working with the materials, setting up some of the lighting cameras in both Format and 3ds Max and Infowix. Uh, look at some different rendering engines. So there's the ones in product, plus I'll touch on some of the ones that we make available on the cloud. And ideally, by the end of the class, you'll be able to take some of this information, uh, leverage your format data to do high-end presentations of your sketch design model. So I try and break it down into three, four key points. Uh, so number one, just an overview of the current presentation tools that you get inside of Format 360, how to export various file formats, from the application and what carries across from one application to another. How to uh, start rendering. So in 3ds Max we have uh, internal rendering applications and also cloud rendering. And then if you want to get into animation but maybe you're not uh, keen to dive into the 3ds Max side of animation, we have the Infowix 360 which is very easy to get up to speed with and start doing what's called bookmarks and uh, doing like a walkthrough from bookmark to bookmark but getting uh, a nice sort of quality, a nice output from Infowix 360. It's built on a, on a gaming engine so it'll give you good graphics. Uh, a quick who, what, how, why, uh, a bit of background. Um, so. I'm uh, originally from uh, New Zealand, and uh, for anybody not familiar with New Zealand, that was the home to Flight of the Concords, which was uh, an HBO special for a couple of years. I worked for up to about 10 years in London as an architect, and uh, spent my time working for companies like Building Design Partnership in conjunction with Langer, Rourke, and Balfabides, and HOK for a short while. And at Autodesk, uh, I work here in Sydney, Australia. I travel around Australia and New Zealand as a technical specialist. My claim to fame at Autodesk is I got to design the data set that ships with Revit. This is the uh, original design before it was just tinkered with a little bit before it was released. Uh, this is the one that uh, I got to do back in 2014, 2013. Also, uh, I like to build classical models of some of the uh, architectural greats, such as Le Corbusier's Ville Savoir, shown here on the screen as a displaced view, and I uh, help students around the world cheat on their uh, university exams with this demo data set. And uh, I'm based um, miles away from yourselves uh, in Sydney, Australia, uh, with my uh, Colombian wife and Chinese pug. So uh, I do have a few videos here and they may be a little bit laggy coming all the way from uh, down under. So uh, this is just something I like to do. I like to experiment with different Autodesk technologies and I will uh, turn down the music a little bit. I'll share these videos with Tom. He, he'll be able to um, put them out there if you want to see the videos. Um, I'll also be putting them up on my YouTube channel. Uh, this is one of the technologies I wanted to be showing today. This is 
Autodesk ART, Autodesk Ray Tracing Engine running on the cloud. It's, uh, it was or is still in beta, I believe, where you can get access to 2,000 cloud credits, link your models in from your authoring application, and then run animations on the cloud. So you don't have to wait for your computer to do the calculations. It pushes to the cloud, and you can uh, let the cloud do the heavy lifting while you can keep on working on your projects. This one was a river model linked into Max. Um, some of the furniture there that's trashed on the floor is actually 3ds max and the characters that are dancing around uh, from a company called Rockerbox. so this is just an example of a thousand frame render which was done on our servers of montreal and uh, it's quite a, a quick and easy way to get out an animation without having to invest in expensive hardware or graphics cards or wait huge amounts of time for the machines to do calculations so that's the ART render, one of our newer rendering engines. Uh, so for those of you new to Formit, I uh, just want to go through the difference between the free version and the pro version. Uh, the free version, of course, is, is available um, uh, to anybody. If you've got the collection, you get access to the pro version. The key uh, differences here down the bottom uh, on the right with the pro version is you're going to get access to the Autodesk material library and if you don't have time to uh, go and create your own textures this is a really powerful resource which has uh, hundreds if not almost a thousand different textures that you could uh, use on the fly to make your graphical model look a lot cleaner and sharper. You get access to real-time collaboration so you can actually run up a, cu uh, a couple of sessions or s invite several people into your model at the same time to do real-time collaboration in the design environment. You get access to solar analysis tools and connection to Insight 360 for conceptual energy analysis. And one of the really strong ones here, which is a game changer, is the importation of Dynamo scripting into Forma 360 to actually drive the geometry. And uh, I will attempt to run a bit of this live today. Um, hopefully the internet's not too slow for me at this end. But this is a really powerful way to automate some of those repetitive features in the modeling space using the Dynamo application. Um, another thing to note is that the former pro version runs on a Windows client. So it's going to run on your desktop application whereas the free version is running on your mobile device or on your browser. Um, it does work with the, the Revit add-in, and probably I'll just touch on this now, just for anybody who's not aware of this or has looked at this inside of Revit. You have in your add-ins, uh, so going back to 2015, 2016, 2017, you have the uh, format converter, and there's, there's four things to note here. Um, one is you can convert your existing Revit family files into Forma 360 files and push them into Forma, uh, put them into a 360 drive so you can access them on your mobile device. Uh, SketchUp files can also be converted to Forma 360 files. However, Forma will read SketchUp files natively and I'll show this in a demo shortly. You can import in your uh, Format 360 data directly into Revit as massing objects and then start converting the massing data into Revit uh, parameters, uh, sorry, parametric uh, families, and you can also reload the families. So this is just something just to be aware of uh, when you're wanting to go from Format into Revit here. That's the Revit add-in. And uh, how to get Format. There's uh, a couple of ways here. Uh, one, you can directly launch it from the web browser. And this is pretty simple. It just fires up, it polishes materials, loads everything up, and you have direct access to form it for free. The other one is you can uh, download um, it directly from the application, get the Windows desktop client. So uh, for more on this, these are some of the links. Uh, so you can buy it online as a separate application or you'll get it included in the AEC collections. 
and if you're on a um, enterprise contract, you get included in, as part of TokenFlex. So these are some of the sites just to take note of to get access to those Windows clients or uh, fire it up online as I'm doing right now. So if I just go back to here, just tick on the agreement, accept. And now we have the uh, form and environment here. So I'm just waiting for that to catch up. So here we have the form and environment. And it's pretty similar when you look at both the mobile or web browser environment um, versus the uh, desktop environment. They've got a similar look and feel. If you do want to get access to the pro features here, you can see that uh, some of them are highlighted with the uh, orange pro button here. And you need to uh, sign in. So if you want to get access to some of your uh, pro features that you get as part of your subscription because you've purchased a pro version but you want to run it online, not run it on just the desktop, you just sign in and this will start to bring up now. I'm in the pro, pro mode and this means now that I can do energy analysis and I can also do solar analysis and if I wanted to share the modeling environment with somebody else. Again, this is in the pro version. We have the collaboration tool and you can start a collaboration session or you can join an existing session. So um, the reason why I am doing this is um, I enjoy good design and I, I really enjoy uh, presenting design ideas and sort of capturing the spirit of the design. So uh, one of my favorite architects is Japanese architect Tadeo Ando. You can see he does these conceptual sketches. And at the end of the process, he produces these very simple, bold, but stunning and elegant buildings. So this is the uh, cafe at the Langdon Fountain of Art Museum. The uh, Nishima. This is actually a visual from a movie that uh, a visual artist, Alex Roman, did. Um, you can watch this online. It's on his uh, Vimo uh, channel, and it's uh, pretty stunning. He does a lot of um, minimalist architects like Tadeo Ando and Louis Kahn. Uh, Kashino uh, House, just coming up. And the one that I'm going to be focusing on today is Tadeo Ando's Church of Light in, um, in Japan, in um, Osaka. And the one on the right there is actually a photo, but the one on the left is a, a visual. So uh, it's quite a, a good data set to actually get some uh, pretty good visuals out of without uh, too much effort. So I chose this as a simple data set to work with just to show you how how you can get up to speed with this type of visualization presentation very quickly. So uh, the Church of Light, we're going to be covering uh, three key softwares. So design authoring in Format 360 Pro using the desktop version. Then taking it out as an FBX file for doing some still renderings in 3ds Max. And then finally finishing up with some basic animations inside of InfoWorks 360. And uh, one of the things that we do have access to, uh, if you haven't seen this, you can render on the cloud as well. And uh, you can either do this from Revit or from 3ds Max or from other applications like AutoCAD. Uh, for anybody who wants to engage in this, you can download a QR reader and I'm going to share some of these uh, QR codes at the end of the presentation. The one that I would recommend is QR Code Reader by Scan. So you can get this for your mobile device. It's free. And at the end of the presentation, I'll put up uh, four uh, QR codes for you to hover your phone over and then you'll be able to load in some of the 360 panoramas into your phone as a, as a takeaway. So for anybody who wants to uh, download that, put it on their phone, at the um, uh, end of the presentation, you'll be able to load in the 3D visuals that I'm presenting today. So 
every time I go out and see a customer, they're like, oh, why do I want to move away from SketchUp into Forma 360? SketchUp's been around for a while. Um, it does what we need to do. We're not sure about using Forma 360. So probably number one is being able to reuse the data inside of Revit because a lot of SketchUp designs, you can't really reuse them inside of Revit. They're throwaways. But if you've done your initial uh, conceptual massing design inside a format and you want to reuse that data, it comes in cleanly into Revit to convert into parametric objects. The interoperability is incredibly powerful. It will allow you to import and export several different file formats. You can bring in your SketchUp data into Format 360 and it plays nice. It groups all the information together and you can open that group and get all the textures. You can also export it out to other file formats for use in other applications, which I'll be showing today. Cloud services, uh, the big one is the Dynamo scripting, being able to bring in a published Dynamo script. And I'll, I'll show this in Dynamo Reach to actually drive geometry, plus the conceptual energy analysis and uh, solar analysis tools. And mobile access, uh, being able to design on your mobile device while sitting at a cafe uh, working on a iPad or a um, Android device, sketching with your fingertips, just doing the basic design. Anybody can use it. It's not just for somebody who has a desktop and a mouse. You can give it to somebody at the uh, director or partner level of the firm, and they can get into the BIM process by using mobile devices and uh, doing their designs in Forma 360. And then finally, uh, visual scripting, as I mentioned earlier, this is the big one, being able to reuse these scripts. It's all part of the next generation of building information modeling where you can use visual scripting to actually drive geometry and automate some of the more laborious ta tasks inside of design. So uh, part one uh, is going to be covering the Format 360 uh, design, and I'm going to be uh, running some videos, but I'll try and jump between the videos and the application. And um, uh, if anybody has any questions or wants to see anything, um, just type into the, the chat window or the question window. And I think maybe Tom or Tobias could just, just let me know if anybody's got any questions. I can sort of jump around and hopefully answer them uh, during the presentation. Uh, yeah, so what I've got so here, good. so far so good? Excellent. So, so, far, so what I've got here is a, a sped up video and I'll, I'll just go through this reasonably slowly by just pausing it, just showing how easy it is to uh, design your model by bringing in uh, the aerial image. So in this case, um, this presentation is not going to be on mainly the modeling, it's going to be more on the presentation, but I just wanted to touch on this before getting into the presentation component. Um, this model bringing in the aerial image from Google Earth and uh, then modeling up these components. So for the second part of the church, it's just point and shoot. I can work in metric. Uh, we don't use Imperial here. So I can use the metric settings. I can create certain components if I want to do like a swept path to say a heavy concrete wall. So in Japan, there's a lot of concrete because of the earthquakes. So here, uh, one of the techniques I'm using um, going beyond just the push and pull technology is uh, creating a, a line or a spline, drawing a shape and then sweeping it along that path. And that's quite an effective way to create one of these massing walls here. So inside of the format application, we do have a number of uh, more advanced modeling tools going beyond just the push pull uh, extrude or leans. And uh, once we start to get uh, the massing components up, we can also do offsets and push and pull those offsets to create, say, parapets like on the screen here. Uh, I love being able to just draw on faces and then clean the faces up as needed. Grouping the items as well is really important so certain geometry doesn't glue together. And the material library is really handy for very quickly uh, texturizing that building. So this is um, just a quick workflow on how easy it is to get up to speed and uh, create the geometry. And what I'll be uh, touching on a little bit later is just a couple of little uh, tricks and tips on how to sort of uh, manipulate the geometry detail. So if you want to get 
more photorealistic images for your presentations, just by making these simple little steps, you'll get uh, a lot more realism in the final output. Uh, the last little bit here is just the final adjustments, of course, looking at reference photos and uh, being able to uh, align snaps to other parts of geometry in the model. Uh, another great thing with uh, the workflows is the reuse of the data. You don't have to make everything inside a format, right? You don't have to make all your uh, furniture, for example. You can reuse uh, your RFA family files by importing them into uh, re uh, importing them into format. So I'll just turn off my voiceover here, and um, probably just note. Um, these videos, because they are uh, lagging just a little bit, I, we do have them available on the Autodesk ANZ YouTube channel. And I'll just quickly uh, just note where they are, just so if anybody does want to look at them directly after the um, presentation. I've got a playlist here, so Autodesk Australia New Zealand. And uh, over here on the right, uh, 15 videos, I think. So these are all the videos from today's presentation. So if you do want to bookmark that, that is the Autodesk ANZ YouTube channel, and we have 15 videos uh, covering the three parts of this presentation today. So uh, because I am presenting from Australia, there's going to be a little bit of a lag, um, but if you do want to watch these videos, you can also watch them on the YouTube channel. So this is just uh, explaining uh, the workflow in terms of bringing in your Revit families into Format 360. And uh, what we have in both the Pro and the Free version is a symbol down here to import in your RFA files. Uh, what happens is when you uh, are in Revit, you convert them to the um, Format file format. Um, the um, options are also is you can actually do these locally. Uh, you can also send them to your uh, A360 drive account. So you've got access to the information both um, on the cloud and on uh, your local machine. So uh, I'm just see it's going to catch up a little bit. So to do this, uh, inside of your Revit environment, we have the convert RFA to Format 360. And uh, just taking these steps here. And what I recommend here, and this works both for uh, your SketchUp data, if you want to convert all your SketchUp data or your family data you have uh, this option to set it up so it automates all the files from the RFA files to the uh, former AXO file format. And uh, what I recommend is you cr create a, a folder, uh, point A and point B, where you put all your Revit families that you want to convert into that folder and then have a destination folder. And uh, this is using locally on the machine if uh, you want to also sync these up to your cloud, just make sure you tick on Upload to A360 Drive. And then if you're um, out on the road and you want to access this data for your mobile device, you've got access to those same uh, Revit families. So these are also, just to note, the types of families that will convert as well. So this will work both for your SketchUp files and your uh, Revit family files, and this can save you a lot of time when it comes to to modeling. So let's go skip forward a little bit. And uh, what I've got here is when I want to add that library to my content library, uh, I can add it from my local path here. So I can add numerous paths. So maybe you have a library for your internal furniture, maybe you have a library for trees or for people or whatever you want to put in. You can add several paths here and you can also have a directory to your A360 account as well. So that's a really uh, help, helpful way to uh, reuse some of the data you've got 
uh, from Revit inside of Format 360. So in this instance, uh, what I've done here is I've created a little bit of furniture for the Church of Light. Uh, the furniture is very bespoke and specific to uh, Tadeo Ando's design here. And this is the native file that's come in. And for this, uh, this, this bench, um, it is, it's coming with all the geometry, it's all grouped, and it doesn't bring across the textures, but you can retexture inside of Forma 360. So when we navigate around to it and uh, select a bit of geometry, you'll notice that uh, it will come up as a grouped object. And I just pause this just here. Uh, it's grouped and you can uh, right click and open that group and you'll be able to manipulate parts of that geometry should you want to. So there are options to bring in the data and manipulate the geometry and you will be told before you go to ungroup and edit the geometry that any changes will be lost when converting back into the original Revit family. So ideally you want to just bring it in and use it as an object that you want to add materials to, but you don't want to be manipulating the geometry and then trying to bring it back into Revit because those changes will be lost. So just be aware of that if um, you're reusing your Revit geometry inside of Format and you make uh, adjustments to that geometry. Uh, the last little bit here is just uh, getting into the materials. So I'll just skip forward just a little bit here. Um, you can, of course, uh, array the information, you don't have to bring it in one by one, you can just uh, copy and array it around the space. And uh, what it does is when it comes in, it will come in as a group, so over here on the right you'll see that uh, under the Church of Light bench RFA, it has a, uh, a base material assigned to it. What I can do is I can um, add materials there or change those materials, so in this instance I'm just going to go and get a material from the main sketch and I can directly paint on that Revit family. So you can either paint on a face of the object or you can double click to actually paint on the entire geometry. And what you'll notice here, because I've done uh, an array of all those uh, benches there, the instances of those arrays uh, automatically updating with the paint finishes that I'm assigning to this river family inside of Format 360. So when I finish doing the uh, painting here, so I just paint the last little bit here, double click to paint the entire bit of geometry, and when you uh, finish off the last command here, and you finish the, um, uh, you close out the group, you'll notice that all the other instances will be painted as well. So there's a, a nice little bit of automation where once you edit the original authoring family or any parts of those families, the uh, materials will adjust and all the repeated uh, components inside the model. Um, interoperability is, is a big one inside of Forma 360 and this one, I just want to uh, perhaps show this uh, live. And I'll just give you an example. This is uh, something that I wanted to get. I didn't want to have to model this. I wanted to grab a tree. And this tree has actually been imported directly from SketchUp. And uh, what you notice here is just when you import it, you can import a 3D, 3D model. And we have all these numerous uh, file formats, so the, the native file format is actually AXM, I said AX so earlier, sorry. Um, you can bring in uh, SDL files, OBJ, SAT, and SketchUp files natively. So I've just brought in a SketchUp file, and the great thing about the interoperability between format and SketchUp is it respects all the materials here. So you can see there's alpha channels for the leaves so these are all uh, faces which have an alpha channel on them, so giving you a bit of transparency and texture for the leaves. It's uh, held onto all the geometry, even the correct uh, UVW mapping of the tr tree trunk. And if we look at, say, the properties 
So if I select on that tree and you look at the properties, it's uh, started to uh, bring in a, as a group. I can give it a name. And I can also right click on that tree now and edit that group. And now inside of these uh, individual items, you'll start to see the materials that have come through. So all of this has been uh, respected when we uh, bring it into format. And should you want to, uh, you can even manipulate the data. So I'll go and grab, say, a face here, and just doing a simple uh, extrusion, I can reuse that SketchUp data, make that tree a bit taller, the texture mapping is, is fine, and I can close that off, and then we have uh, SketchUp data being reused inside a form with no problems. The uh, material editor as well, what I really like here is that um, you have a grouped selection of materials. So all of this comes through, it groups it for you, and you've got access to reuse these materials on other parts of your model. So it brings in the geometry, the materials, it groups it together, it's editable, and you can reuse that SketchUp data, or you can go and get SketchUp data and bring it into format for reuse, as well as the Revit data. So uh, that was just the live version, and this is just the example of actually bringing in a SketchUp file, so the SKP file format. And uh, this one, uh, just check the audience view is catching up. This one I actually uh, brought in uh, some some people. So I went there. I, I it wasn't like a heavy file. It was just a light cutout file. But if I just skip forward a little bit, it's actually uh, when this catches up, you'll see it's Natalie Portman out walking her dog. But it's a, a photograph that's come through. It's a lightweight file. It's an alpha channel, and I can use that uh, inside of Forma 360. And you'll see it even captures the uh, shadows as well. So it's a very quick way to go and get uh, people for con context. And again, even though it's just a single face, I can go and open up the group and see the materials that are embedded within it. So really a handy way if you need to get trees or people or other types of contextual information, you can uh, re-leverage the SketchUp data for use inside of Format 360. And you can see here also, just another quick note, uh, a good practice is to put everything onto layers. So I try and put uh, the rivet data, the furniture, the people, the trees, whatever it is, uh, just throw it on layers and it just makes it so much easier to manage the content as you're developing the design. So uh, just touching on the cloud services, I probably won't be able to demo this very well live, but uh, I will do my best just to quickly uh, bring this up. So I'm just gonna do a new, a new sketch here. And um, if I just go and do a, a simple uh, point, point and shoot, and just wait for that screen to catch up. Uh, so just for this, this bit of geometry, if I wanted to invite somebody into the uh, environment, first of all, just to note, uh, I am signed in, and this is the tool that's gonna allow you to collaborate in real time. Maybe you wanna be uh, collaborating with someone who's down at a cafe working on a, a mobile device. I've actually done this live um, at sessions at universities where I've been teaching the class and then I invite all the students into uh, the design session. And they uh, will take the um, session information, I can either email it to them or they can enter in the, um, the number here. So if I go uh, and just go, so what, what I've done, just to explain here, I've um, started a sharing session and then I can actually email that link to somebody, or um, for anybody who isn't formal at the moment, you can actually uh, enter in this detail here, 
these numbers, and that's the ID to actually join that session. So uh, for anybody who is following along live, you can actually enter in uh, these numbers here, and you'll appear in the uh, user session here. So it's a really quick way to get people uh, on board to join the session, and then people can come in, they can see your screen, they can start sketching in real time here, and you can both be uh, working in the design environment. You can also uh, chat to other users, so down the bottom right hand corner here, you can uh, chat to other people who joined the session, and you can track their camera as well, so if they're moving around the model, maybe they want to show you a detail on the corner. So we see, hi John. So John's joined. And um, John should be able to see what's going on on the, the screen here. And uh, whatever I start designing, or if he wants to start designing, another, another user here, uh, Thornstein. So uh, yeah, you guys can start uh, drawing on the model at the same time. And hopefully you better do this from, from your end. And we can have chats and people can start working on, on the model and manipulating the model. Let's see. There we go. Sam, so I can see. Sam, uh, I to, uh, Sam, I wanted to jump in and <clears throat> let you know you did have a question about uh, using Max for rendering versus yep. using Revit for rendering as far as the okay. cloud rendering. Any pros right. or cons with those approaches, and I wasn't sure if you were going to get into Max today or not. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm probably taking a bit too long on uh, on the session, so I'm, I'm just about to move into Max now. So I'll oh. um, I'll answer that in the uh, yeah next session. So I'm just going to uh, close the sharing session here, or I'll, I'll let uh, John and Thornston keep designing on the model. <laughs> so that's worked quite well. So collaborating from different parts of the world or in real time on yeah, the webinar cool. with, uh, with low bandwidth. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, what I'll do, I'll, I'll move into Max, um, and I'll just highlight just for anybody you know uh, wanting to look at some of the other stuff like the Dynamo stuff or looking at topography. There's the um, format blog here, um, but I'm going to move uh, straight into uh, the visual styles inside of format, then go into Max, and then. Um, answer the question that is um, the difference between cloud rendering from Revit versus cloud rendering from Max and what I found to be the different strengths between the two of them. Uh, just a quick note here, um, the visual styles inside of Format, um, you've got a number of visual styles that will give you great graphics. So uh, sometimes just a nice simple graphic like this where we hide the materials is quite powerful because sometimes clients can get caught up in materials when you're just wanting to be talking about the geometry and the form and the spaces. And uh, I really like the ambient occlusion type shadows that just give you a nice sort of uh, look and feel to the design. And uh, for anybody who used to use the old blue pencils on the drawing board before you actually inked it up, um, I like to have these sort of uh, type of graphics here as well with the crosshairs on the edges just to sharpen up the points. Um, you can also test the back faces as well. Uh, before going out to maybe doing a 3D print or sending it out. And then internally uh, in the application, what I tend to recommend for visuals, whether it's in Revit or 3ds Max or Format, is use morning or evening lighting so you get the longer shadows cast into the space. What I've found is best though for the interiors is to turn the shadows off. You can see it makes it a little bit too dark on the inside, but if you um, turn the uh, shadowing off, you can get some good results on the interiors, and then for the exteriors, I tend to uh, turn off the edges and reduce the silhouettes a little bit. I go for like the low shots, and I like to include uh, the trees and the people here just to give it a bit more of a scale, and you can see with the low shadows, you're going to get the uh, tree branches casting sh uh, shadows on the concrete there. So. Um, Let me just uh, get rid of my voice over here. Um, so if anybody wants to create trees, let's say you have um, uh, brought in trees in SketchUp, maybe you're not happy with it. 
inside of Max, uh, and this is probably one of the strengths, inside of Max you can create a lot of geometry very quickly. And uh, what this one is here is um, is an add-in to Max from a company called Libelwork. And you can actually uh, instantly build a tree but customize the geometry count or the polygon count inside the application. So Libelwork you can get um, a free library access. There's a paid version as well where you can get like localized trees for wherever you work in the world. But what I've done here is uh, used the add-in inside of Max and then uh, just optimize the information. And I've exported out the OBJ file from Max to use inside of Format. So uh, I can bring in that geometry. I've kept it quite, quite light. Um, I don't want it to be too heavy. But I can bring in the geometry. It comes in clean into Format. And then I can start uh, adding textures. I like this website here. This is textures.com where you can get any type of texture you want in the world and uh, then create my own trees uh, inside of Format for reuse in other projects. So I can save that out and then uh, import and merge it into my uh, church design here. Um, the cameras inside of Format are really powerful uh, now as well because we've got this new tool which allows you to actually edit the scene cameras. So if you haven't seen this, you can turn on the uh, edit scene and it's going to highlight all your cameras and you can actually go and grab the camera location or even the camera target and manipulate it and uh, with this you can stitch uh, the camera paths together by including certain cameras in an animation. So this is the uh, internal animation and uh, inside the application. I'm going to replicate this again inside of, of Max. Uh, and of course you can do this type of thing inside of Revit as well. So um, this is just the, the video path uh, playing, it's just catching up a little bit, um, doing a basic animation around inside of Format 360. Um, so moving into the question that was asked, um, whether to use Revit or whether to use 3ds Max, um, I like to use Max in this instance because at, at the moment um, uh, the textures and the geometry come through pretty cleanly although there was an update inside of uh, Format where the textures do transfer into to Revit. Um, but because I'm not developing this one into a parametric model straight away, I'm just using it for instant visualization before I commit to setting up a Revit project, um, this would be the reason why I'm using Max. So, I can uh, export out images or OBJs or um, DAE files. I can also uh, fine tune how detailed I want that image to be. Um, what I'm going to do for Max though is I'm going to export it out as an F FBX. And this is where we get into part two, uh, where we can start doing uh, renderings that get a lot closer to photorealism. So, um, there's two ways to do it. Number one is you can take it to the cloud on Autodesk 360. And you can do this from Revit, but you can also do it from 3ds Max. One of the things I found that was a strength inside of 3ds Max was if you set up your own customized HDRI texture map inside of Max and then send it to the cloud, um, that will render with the customized HDRI. So for those of you not familiar with HDRIs, that's the uh, background. It's a high dynamic range image. Uh, it's the background that actually illuminates the or lights the model. So what you're seeing on the screen here on the left-hand side is my customized background image, the HDRI. And because it's set at sunset, it's actually changing the color of the concrete, giving it a warm effect. And this can be rendered on the cloud or rendered in product, but when you send it to the cloud from Max, it tends to hold the HDRI. So that was one of the strengths that I found uh, taking it to Max. Um, again, these videos are all uh, hosted on the Autodesk ANZ YouTube channel. And this is just explaining how you export it out as an FBX file format. And then importing it into 3ds Max. You can also uh, link files as well 
and this could be another workflow that might be of interest. So, uh, guys, just let me know if I'm going to go too much over time. Where are we? Yeah, we'll keep you posted. We're about ten minutes okay. away from the um, official deadline, and you know you can probably keep okay. running for a little bit longer, and people stick around or drop off. But um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of things you can actually do here. Should you want to try and keep a live link between either Revit or between your format exported FBX file, uh, you can actually link it in. So if I'm linking in an FBX you can choose that particular file, link it in, and once it's linked into the environment, um, you can then, maybe you're still designing in format, you want to keep on working in format, um, you can uh, overwrite that FBX file, so export out from format, override the FBX, and then you've got an option here to actually uh, manage the link. And it's like an XREF, uh, the file will be linked in here, and you can choose to reload it and then overwrite um, any geometry that you want to overwrite in 3ds Max. Uh, the same thing that we've had for a number of years now is also the uh, Revit link as well. So maybe you're going from Format into Revit, you're developing in a Revit, you can also link through that Revit file uh, cleanly as well. And Sam, we had a question pop up <coughs> for local renders in Max. Which of the render engine setups do you use? before sending it to the cloud yep. for finals. Okay, so um, I'll jump forward just to that. Where were we? So that's a really good question. Um, so there are numerous uh, rendering engines inside of 3ds Max, and the one I would recommend uh, if you're wanting to render locally, like maybe you've run out of cloud credits, um, you can use the Autodesk Ray Trace engine. That was one of the ones I showed at the, at the beginning with the people dancing in the apartment. This is a really simple rendering engine. Um, it's just got one tab for ART rendering and just some basic sliders here to adjust the quality and whether you want to filter out the noise a little bit. This will render pretty fast. You don't have to do too much to the model. Whereas if you look at uh, a comparison rendering engine like Mental Ray, this can be really overwhelming because you've got to start looking into the properties of global illumination and final gathering, uh, indirect lighting, and also sample qualities and all this other stuff. And, and this, this can take a little bit of time to learn. Or if you're using other tools like V-Ray, um, it has similar sort of detail within it. So if you're new to uh, rendering and you want a simple render, the ART render inside of 3ds Max is, is pretty simple and easy to use. Um, just about to drop back a little bit. Um, and again, just for the sake of time, all these videos are available on the, uh, the YouTube site, the ANZ YouTube site. So this will take you through the process of uh, the uh, texture mapping. So when you actually bring that form model in, it will hold the textures, and uh, you can load these from the application uh, from 3ds Max. You can actually use this little eyedropper tool, pull the material off the form model, and then reuse it inside of your Max environment here. So there's a there's a few little um, handy tools here to actually reuse some of the format created textures inside of Max and then start building up the scene there if you want a bit more detail inside of your visualization. The other handy thing here, and I'll just bring this up a little bit larger, and the other handy thing here is um, inside of Max there's also a uh, physical material library and if you go and choose physical materials it will have preset materials for more complex type of materials like glass, which has um, reflections and refractions with light passing through it. So what I'd recommend is uh, reuse the form materials for the solids, but for things like glazing, where you've got to have light passing through them, just uh, use the material editor inside of Max and use the physical materials and all the pre-made materials work really well. So I can just go and drag and drop materials onto certain bits of geometry 
to uh, get them looking a little bit sharper and actually have light passing through them. The uh, daylighting as well. Um, when you link in the Revit model into 3ds Max, that will keep the daylighting. Uh, however, Format uh, doesn't do this, but you can very quickly create a daylight if you um, go to the. Let's find the drop down for this to see. So if you go to the Create uh, menu here, we have lights, and you've got photometric lights. Just choose the daylight system, and just say yes to um, all the. Uh, components, it will set everything up for you, and then you'll have natural lighting set up. And with the uh, lighting, you can select the actual light here and even pick the location. So for this location, it's in Osaka in Japan. I can actually go to the uh, map inside of 3ds Max and choose the railroad location, being Osaka, uh, Japan here, and it will. It will orientate the sun with the azimuth and altitude and its um, properties to match the lighting in that part of the world. So that's a really uh, simple way to set up your lighting. You can also start to turn on uh, high quality inside of the 3ds Max. So at the top here is a little high quality uh, uh, in brackets. You can go from standard to high quality and it will start to turn on the lighting in real time. So you'll be able to instantly see how that light is going to illuminate your former important model inside of Max uh, instantly before you even commit to a render. So you can see here when I move the sun to the left of the building um, to a different uh, altitude, it's casting longer shadows and you can see it being cast immediately within the 3ds Max browser there. Um, the last thing to note before committing to a render is um, just looking at the environment and effects, um, making sure you've got the physical sky. This is just the thing that gives you the background illumination and uh, just adjusting your exposure control. And what I recommend here is just to use some of the, the basic settings here, um, just using your physical cameras. And I do have a tutorial on this as well. Um, but basically, it just allows you to test everything before you commit to a render. The uh, cameras are explained in this tutorial. And um, recently, we uh, released what's called physical cameras inside of 3ds Max. And this is like um, the way cameras used to be, where you used to be able to adjust um, the f-stop and uh, the type of film you'd put in the camera. Same sort of principles here with a physical camera inside of Max. When you use these, um, you just set up the properties of that camera. And I, I cover this on the uh, YouTube clip on how to put in the best uh, settings for the exterior shots and the interior shots, uh, how to adjust um, the field of view and also adjust um, how to uh, get the shot looking more vertical by adjusting the tilt. And then finally, just some of the tricks before committing to the render, um, adjusting your exposure. When it's too overexposed, that means there's too much light coming into the camera. So what you need to do is make an adjustment uh, to those settings and uh, let in less light. So adjust that exposure value down here. And uh, instantly inside of Max now, we start to get um, something that's going to begin to look like a, a photorealistic render. The uh, other strength that um, I mentioned earlier that was uh, the difference between, say, Revit and 3ds Max for rendering, rendering is the HDRIs. And I found this site here. This is a really good site where you can download uh, HDR skies for free for use in your application. You'll get the ones that are about 4,000 pixel pixels wide, which will give you uh, a good result. Um, however, however, you can buy the, the larger ones, which will give you excellent quality. So uh, this is a little plug for this website called HDRI. It's um, it's pretty good. You can get numerous types of skies. So uh, like for me, I like the sunrise or the evening shots where you get the warmer light for concrete, which can be a very harsh material. Um, but you can download any one of these and then test them and you'll, you'll notice the difference in your render when it's illuminated with an HDRI. And I'll just turn it down. 
Um, and again, uh, to learn how to use an HDRI inside of 3ds Max, um, I've got a tutorial tutorial on it, and this just takes you through uh, the basic sky that you get within 3ds Max, which is like a, a mental ray sky versus loading in the HDRIs, and this just explains how to set up the HDR, HDRI here to push light into your model, uh, and it's quite a powerful way to actually illuminate the space and give it that sort of uh, color that you want. When you first render it, it will come out a little bit dark, so what you want to do is crank up the um, RGB output, and uh, again, this is noted in the, in the video, and you'll see on the screen here, we have um, some renders with that HDR lighting, and you can see it changes the color of the concrete. It even gives you like a base here with some grass. So potentially, if you're just wanting a quick and dirty render, you don't need to go out to to Photoshop. You could probably just get away with using that for your first and a short render. Um, and what I've got here, I just duplicated the screen, and I just wanted to show you the difference between HDRIs. Um, I can go and bring in another one, which is clouds in the middle of the day, and you can see the impact it makes on uh, the final output. So Sam, I wanted to give you about a five minute warning. We're at the top of the hour, so yeah, just for everybody who's still on the call, if you're interested, Sam could probably go on for, what do you think, Sam, hours, days? Yeah, yeah. Days, um, hours, all the absolutely. details. Um, but yeah, I've, uh, just five minutes to wrap it up a little bit. Um, we don't really have any closing okay. comments, so it's it's all you. Um, but probably better stop at some point. Yep. Okay. okay. Cool. It's fine. All right. I'll um, I'll, I'll go through it uh, pretty pretty quick. So just just a couple of tips here on where to get trees from. This is the Lobo website. Uh, you can get access to their free uh, plants kit here. Uh, for people, um, this is one that I've actually done for a company called Render People coming up. This one is uh, 3D people that uh, laser scan and then turn into 3D models, and this is a little render I did for them for uh, an apartment. And uh, some of the free ones you can get to download and test. Some of them even come uh, rigged, so they're ready to go should you want to do animations. And uh, just going back, this is the screenshot of the rendering engine side by side. And uh, if you do want to you do uh, animations on the cloud using the ART rendering engine, I think this is still available on our beta website. You can get access to cloud rendering, and uh, you'll get up to 2,000 cloud credits. You push your models up there. I was doing this actually at Autodesk University where I'd send my models up. I was tracking the rendering progress on my phone, and uh, this just did it all for me as opposed to me waiting for my computer to do it. This hey, is the hey, interface. Could you, yep. could you say a little more about what the, what's the difference between ART and A360 cloud rendering? Is there any difference? Um, yep. So uh, in, inside of Max, um, when we look at the uh, rendering engines, uh, the cloud rendering engine has a slightly different rendering engine from the ART rendering engine. Um, oh, the re is that the rapid? The Rapid RT. Um, the, um, the well, the one the one on the screen at the moment that's the cloud rendering one, um, and that works more with a mental ray based engine. Whereas um, my render at the moment, if I go and move to um, one of the renders here, if I go to ART render. Um, this is the, the one that will um, allow you to go to the cloud. I think my cloud subscription has actually ended for this one. But um, yes, yeah, so, so probably to clarify, there's, there's two ways you can render on the cloud. One is the A360 cloud rendering mode, and this is sort of similar to the interface of what you'll see going out of Revit. Uh, and then there is the uh, other one that I had, which was my uh, ray tracer one. I've already um, spent my cloud credits though, <laughs> so um, you'd have to um, uh, subscribe to get access to that one. But uh, in, inside the actual application, uh, just to note, you've got all these different types of rendering engines. Mental Ray is the default one here. Um, ART is, is a new one, which I think is just nice and easy to use.
options. Another one to look at might be iRay. Um, it's got a similar interface to the ART rendering engine. It works with mental ray materials. So if you link through a river model, it will um, work with those, those uh, materials. And it's just got some basic settings here for you to get up to speed with, with rendering really quickly. Cool. Um, the, the one that I got on the PowerPoint screen just coming up here, this is the interface that you see on the cloud with the ART rendering engine, whereas the interface you see with the um, next one I'm bringing up here, the A360 cloud rendering engine, uh, it's a little construction thing I'm working on at the moment. Um, this is the standard one you'll see either from 3ds Max or from um, Revit or from AutoCAD, and these are some of the ones for the uh, the Church of Light. And so your uh, these ones were rendered directly from Max, and uh, they have the customized HDRIs. And I'm just going to see if that's going to fire up. Um, I'll be sharing these in a couple of minutes just on um, the barcode scans. Uh, you can render these out, get some nice results. It's just cleaning up a little bit. And this is the panorama. Um, the other strength here, uh, looking between Revit and 3ds Max, is that in 3ds there's some RPC people, but they're not that uh, convincing. Whereas 3ds Max, I'm using the render people, and I think that's now cleaned up a little bit. And I've got the little work trees, which look a lot more convincing. And then if I just spin around a little bit, here's our Church of Light format model. And it's come out you know, quite nice and clean. I think there's someone out here. Yeah, for anybody who's uh, staying in for the barcode scans at the end, um, you'll be able to load this into your phone. And if you've got something like a Google Cardboard or a, a basic VR headset, you'll be able to load this in. and uh, it's pretty freaky when you get close to this lady with the camera. <laughs> okay. So, um, last last little bit. This is the uh, result that you can get after the ART uh, rendering, and this was on the little teaser for the video. So this, you know, renders out in a few hours, comes back all stitched together. It's got my customized um, HDRI lighting in the background. I haven't had to do too much with the configuration of the rendering engine or go to any sort of expert uh, modes. It's just point, shoot, use the setups that I explain in the YouTube channels and you'll be able to get out um, some nice quality visuals uh, within a short amount of time without having to spend years learning rendering engines, which is what I had to do in the past. Now, um, I know we're at the hour. Yeah, I just wanted to mention to everybody to um, Sam's whole class is posted on the AU website, and I just put a link for that in the chat window, so you guys can watch the tail end of it if you wanted to, because this is the InfoWorks part. Um, takeaway here. Um, if anybody's got the bar barcode reader or the QR reader on their phone and wants to scan these now, so they've got some of the uh, visuals on their phones, um, just uh, load it up on your phone, scan over any of the images and they'll now load it to your phone and it will bring up a um, stereo panorama. So when you hold your phone vertically, you'll get the uh, standard view that you can spin around. Um, and if you turn your phone on its side, it will bring up two screens. And that uh, enables you to place it inside of a headset. And then when you look in the headset, it looks um, pretty convincing. Pretty sweet, Sam. So uh, yeah, so maybe, maybe what I could do, um, the InfoWorks part is posted on, online. And the just a reminder for anybody who um, had a lag in the videos at your end. Uh, all of these videos with a lot more detail uh, are available on the um, Autodesk ANZ YouTube website. And this goes into a deeper dive on how to set up materials, how to set up your cameras, how to use the cloud, and then how to uh, get into InfoWorks. Similar process of exporting our format and then just some simple 
some parts and animations there at the end. Thank you, Sam, for your expertise and for joining Format Friday. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Sorry I went for so long. <laughs> Uh, no, I, you know, somebody commented, um, Joseph, that we've got time. You know, I think people, on an interesting topic like this, uh, people stick around for a long time. It's great. Excellent. Uh, so, yeah, we really appreciate you spending some of your time with us. Great. Great. And um, did, did you want to go for the Q&A? Sure, yeah, if anybody's got anything um, that they want to ask Sam directly. We definitely hang out here for a few seconds. Um, there was a lot of questions that popped up during, and I was trying to answer them as we went. Um, and you got a, a bunch of awesome stuff, beautiful kind of comments along those lines. Thank you so much. So, um, yeah, appreciative fan base here, Sam, for sure. Sure. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, um, somebody mentioned uh, – oh, sorry. Yeah, you mentioned the VR stuff. Yeah, just a little bit. Um, do you want to talk about play at all, yeah. what you were talking about yeah. before, before we kicked off? Yep. Uh, so for those still on, uh, we've just released uh, Play, and uh, this is available on Labs. And what this allows you to do with your panoramas is load them into this play environment and that's going to be strange. Hmm. Okay, um, it just jumped around a little bit. So uh, you, you you can bring in your panoramas into the play environment, and it will stitch them together, together, and then give you this little uh, walkthrough, like a VR walkthrough of your project. So if you want to sort of see project play sample files. Uh, they're available on play-docs.autodesk.com sample projects and it will take you through uh, what people are starting to use play for even laser scanning and uh, the one I'd recommend is looking at the um, the building walkthrough so if you go to click on this one and uh, there's numerous tutorials and templates you can use to get up to speed with it this is really incredible because maybe uh, you don't have access to like a, an HTC Vive or an Oculus headset and you don't have computers with the gaming cards that you need to run them. This is um, a really good stepping stone for getting into VR. So you could take your four model into Max, do a 360 panorama on the cloud and then load it into play and uh, when you send this to your phone and you put it into the headset device, when you look around, there's like a little uh, white pointing dot on the uh, center of the, the viewer. When you hover over one of the pinpoints, it takes you from room to room to room. And there's other features that allow you to turn the lights on and off and change material colors and even swap out furniture. So this is now the play environment at the moment, and I'm just showing on the web browser. but uh, up here is the option to actually flick between uh, daytime and nighttime. So I can go and click uh, one of these uh, items here, and it will now illuminate it with the artificial lights. Oh, nice! So I think it's just coming coming through. Uh, so there's yeah. all these little functions. So, yeah. I had a question that just popped up from Ian over at RNL. Uh, thanks for tuning in and sticking around, Ian. Um, can I export a stereo JPEG from Lumion into Play? Um, I think so, yeah, because, um, well, there's, there's a bit of a process to do it, but if you've got like a, a 6 or 12-sided image, what you can do is, and I'll just bring up the tutorial, tutorial for this, um, you have um, on our render, render them speechless project play. Mm -hmm. There's a little tutorial on how to actually. Um, was it? There's a little tutorial on how to actually take a stereo panorama, and it doesn't necessarily need to be from our application, but you take that uh, output, and I'm not 
that familiar with Lumion, but I'm presuming when you export it out, you can uh, get this six or 12 sided uh, set of cubes here. You can then uh, use a little tool called Image Magic, and what you can do with this installed is you run a little uh, a CMD uh, command prompt tool, and it takes all of these images and then chops them up into individual plates, which you can then bring into Project Play. So, um, or you can do it in Photoshop. This is just one of the automatic, automatic ways of doing it. So, inside of Project Play, these are all the uh, stereo panoramas that have been loaded up. They were just chopped up. And uh, if we look at the command prompt down the bottom here in the control graph, uh, this is the node uh, that actually drives those um, parts of the cube. So you can see here, there's a lot of complexity behind it. <laughs> That's why there's some great templates for you to, to leverage inside the application. But that does all the, uh, the work for you. It's all driven by those nodes. So um, there's a really good tutorial on how to get up and running just here. And uh, the sample project, just going back here, one of the really powerful things that I like is uh, when we move up to this uh, particular view by the bar, um, they've added this node that allows you to change the wall color. So you could give this to a client and they're saying, well, I can't decide between um, uh, mustard and white. You could put on the headset and say, well, look, just, just uh, align your head with the mustard color and it will automatically load in uh, just that, that color for you. So this is a really um, easy and simple way to get into VR without having to invest in the hardware which can cost, you know, I'm trying to get the hardware myself at the moment and I'm getting quotes between four and nine thousand dollars for a computer. Um, whereas perhaps, you know, you just get a headset and uh, use this tool, and uh, we can swap out the furniture as well. Well, that so that's, that's something you. For. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's pretty cool, and uh, I I think you know if you go through um, a lot of the available samples here, uh, there's some really cool stuff they're doing. There's a laser scanning one as well. Um, someone has scanned somebody in is in New York. Sorry about that. There's no background noises coming through on my end. Uh, it could be me or Josh too. Sorry um, about that. Keep going. Might be me. Sorry. Um, this one is a 3D scan, and um, let's say you want some people. You want to put yourself in the model. I believe this is from Remake, and you can bring in the Remake model, and uh, it comes in uh, textured. So you could actually scan yourself with your phone, and then export it out as an FBX, uh, bring it into uh, Format, or as an OBJ, bring it into Format, and then uh, yeah, start presenting this way. So. It's going to be a really interesting um, application for for our users. Yeah, the web access uh, is so easy for sharing, and um, yeah. yeah, like you said, zero upfront cost with a headset or yeah, yeah, PC with GPU power. Yeah, good stuff. All right. So yeah, I think that's about everything in mind. Um, are there any more questions coming in? Uh, nope, that was that was it for the questions. But um, I feel like a great, um, you know, little little Easter egg tucked in there at the end of the presentation. Okay. So um, we do not have our February. Um, Format Friday scheduled at this point, but we will definitely be posting that through our blog and through our Twitter and um, possibly through a future LinkedIn group. We'll see about that. Uh, but thanks everybody for attending and for sticking around and for uh, sticking with us past our um, cool intro audio glitch, um, which I think we should probably turn into a soundbite and have that be a Format Friday 
intro music. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and, and again, thanks for making the effort from all the way from Australia. Well, thanks, thanks for having me, and thanks for um, accommodating me on a Friday morning. Yeah, no, it's cool. Uh, it's Friday somewhere. That's all that matters. <laughs> um, yeah, and thanks for pulling the the link up again. Uh, Austin was just asking about the the QR code. So Austin, um, we'll leave this up on the screen, and in the meantime, if you don't catch it, definitely check out the AU video because they're listed there also. They're, you're, the handouts from Sam's class are in that um, on that web page too, and that's in the chat window. And you got a couple more love it's and thanks and good one. Okay. All right, Sam. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye, everyone. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks.